Hello, students. And let me extend a particular welcome to students at the University of the West Indies. Uh, if you are listening to this video, you are probably have just entered the university and just entered the Faculty of Medical Sciences. And it's a brave new world we're living in, in the midst of this pandemic. And I want to welcome you and look forward to working with you over the next uh, period of time. If you're listening to this and you're not a member of the University of the West Indies, you're part of the global audience, let me also welcome you. And I hope that you too benefit from the session that we're doing today. Today we're starting a journey and we're looking at the course, The Health Professional and Society. And this is a wider program in professionalism, ethics, and communication. And that's very, very important for you as a future health professional, because as you've seen upon the title, Designing the Future, as we go through the session today, I want you to think about where will you be in five years' time? Where will you be in three years' time when you graduate? And I want you to think about um, what type of health professional that you intend to be. And that's why I've left this open-ended by putting it as a question mark, because you indeed are designing the future. So let me begin by starting with a quotation. Uh, this is a quotation from C.S. Lewis. Uh, he's an Oxford professor, uh, but he's best known for being an author. He wrote the fantasy novels about the land called Narnia. And he made this statement, education without values, as useful as it is, seems rather to make man a more clever devil. Now, what is Lewis going after here? Well, he seems to be suggesting that you can spend the first 23, 24 years of your life receiving a lot of education, uh, receiving uh, almost 20 out of those 24 years of your life spent in school. And you will emerge at the end of that process with a degree and with great competence. But he's suggesting that if you have not acquired a value system, a moral compass, then what has been created is simply somebody who will perpetuate wickedness, and the, hence the use of the term devil. This is put a little bit more um, directly by a former U.S. president, Theodore Roosevelt, when he said to educate a, mind, a man in mind and not in morals is to educate a menace to society. And so in this course, we want to begin looking at what is the moral responsibility or what moral responsibility do you have as a future health professional to the wider society? Because we don't want to educate you and have you leave these walls as an optometrist or a pharmacist dentist or a doctor, but what we're sending out into society is a menace, someone who cannot benefit society. So let me take you back to a mobile app that was very, very popular a couple of years ago. Uh, so popular that they made a movie. Uh, and as you can see on your screen, that mobile application is Angry Birds. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember playing Angry Birds, but Angry Birds was dependent upon one particular principle, one particular principle. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you can guess what that principle is, but that's the principle of trajectory, trajectory. So you can see in that diagram right there that in the Angry Birds game, uh, a bird would be uh, projected from a slingshot and the aim of the bird would be to knock down the structure where the pigs were contained. But the key to your success was the actual trajectory, how you lined up your shot. And I want just to use that as a metaphor for your life, because you are on a particular trajectory in life. The very fact that you're here in studying optometry or medicine means your life is on a particular trajectory. And that's a trajectory of success. For the vast majority of you, you are going to graduate. I would estimate that for over 90% of you, you are going to graduate in three years or four years or five years. So if that's the case, I want you to recognize 
that the, the future, your future is going to be determined by the choices that you make today. If you are not, for you not to graduate, you have to make some very, very bad choices. Some very, very bad choices. But once you continue to make good choices, and once you continue to make sensible choices, there's an over 90% chance that you will graduate. Now, if that means the majority of you are going to graduate in the near future, it then raises a different question. And that question is this. The real question we should be asking ourselves as we begin our journey is not, will I become a dentist? Will I become a doctor? But the real question you should be asking yourself is, what kind of dentist will I be? What kind of doctor will I be? What kind of pharmacist will I be? Or to put it another way, who am I becoming? And I want us to take this right back to the quote that I was talking to you about a little while ago. So the question that C.S. Lewis is asking is, are we just training doctors or are we training people who can contribute to society? And therefore, you need to be asking yourself this particular question. Who am I becoming? Who am I becoming? Not so much in my skill and my competence, but in the construct of who am I on the inside and what's going to motivate the choices and actions that I take. And that's where the whole issue of professionalism comes in. Now, as we start to think about this, I want to reference a television show that was quite popular, uh, might be five to 10 years ago now. And I'm sure when you see this image, uh, you will be familiar with this television program. Uh, it's a program House. And this is how one person described House. Dr. House, a brilliant doctor with no bedside manner, brings a whole new meaning to the words of noxious and abrasive. House trusts no one, doesn't know what proper grooming is, and is addicted to vicodin. Bi a classic example of a sociopathic jerk who under normal circumstances wouldn't be worth the time it took to mention his name, except for one thing. Dr. House happened to be a genius in his field. And the question we can ask ourselves is, is Dr. House a good doctor? We know he has a lot of knowledge. We know from the television program, he has the ability to diagnose situations. But the question is, is he a good doctor? And one of the unwritten messages that seem to be coming up across in the program is because of his brilliance, because of his ability to solve problems that nobody else seemed to be able to solve, that maybe that is what a good doctor is. And I want you just to take a a little moment and, and think about that. In your opinion, is Dr. House a good doctor? And relate that to who you want to become and what type of pharmacist you want to become in the future. Now, as we think about this, uh, we can uh, use this image of an iceberg to describe the nature of you as a human being. Now this we can call is the iceberg principle. And I think we've all heard about the Titanic, uh, that great ship that set sail over 100 years ago uh, and then actually hit an iceberg. Now given the fact that an iceberg is so big, one wonders how did the ship's captain and crew not see the iceberg and not have enough time to turn the ship around to avoid the iceberg? Well, the reason for that is an iceberg uh, because of the nature of the material that is made up of ice. One tenth of the size of the iceberg approximately is seen above the surface, but actually nine tenths is below the surface. And so by the time the person saw the iceberg, they were a lot closer to it than they realized because a large extent, 90% of its mass was extending below the surface of that they could not see. And it was too late to turn around. And I want you to think about that as a construct of your life. People see uh, your skills and your competence, but really who you are is determined by what is your value system? What are your morals? What are your perspectives? What are your understanding? 
as you can see in this next slide. The iceberg principle says what you do is what's seen on the outside, but your value system is the 90% of the iceberg. And we can say that that value system consists of the things that you think are important, how you see yourself, your identity, your motives, what energizes you, and your philosophy, what is your worldview. And those are the things that we want to address in this course on professionalism. And we want to introduce you to what a good health professional, what the code of conduct is, what does the body of optometrists worldwide or in your particular nation say about those questions. Because each health profession has sought to answer these questions and establish a code of professional conduct that gives some guidance along these lines. Now, you might be wondering, why is this important? You might say, well, I don't really care about what C.S. Lewis said, and I disagree with Theodore Roosevelt. So I just want to share with you a couple of research studies that have linked professionalism, ethics, and communications to the success of health professionals. Why does professionalism matter? Why does ethics matter? Why does communication matter? Why does that hidden nine-tenths matter? So many studies, and this is just one, have found that patients are more likely to comply with the direction of a health professional if they demonstrate empathy and understanding of the patient's condition. So let's go back to our, our illustration of Dr. House. He often would produce great diagnoses, but following diagnosis, there must be a plan of action. And what we're saying is, Patients are more likely to follow the plan of action of their health professional when that health professional demonstrates good bedside manner, when that health professional communicates well, when that health professional demonstrates empathy and has genuine care and concern for the patient, when that health professional demonstrates professionalism. And so we're introducing you into the whole world of patient compliance. Just because you ask a patient to take their medication or just because you recommend a particular course of action about brushing your teeth does not mean your patient is going to do that. And studies have shown again and again that professionalism affects whether patients follow your advice or not. Well, why else does it matter? you are going to enter a profession that's quite high stress. Many, many doctors, dentists, nurses suffer from burnout. And what they've found is persons with higher levels of emotional intelligence, persons with a strong value system are much, likely to, much less likely to suffer from burnout. That not only has an implication for you, but that also has an implication for your patients because health professionals that suffer burnout put their patients at risk. Why else does it matter? Well, a lack of professionalism within a team can cause cognitive impairment within the other team members. When members of a team are abusive or do not communicate well, what that does is somehow it distorts the thinking. That's what we mean by cognitive impairment. It distorts the thinking of other persons. And the result of that is it's going to also endanger the life of the patient. Because one, the team isn't uh, functioning cohesively. And now others' thinking systems are not actually working well. And they could be making bad decisions. And all of these things are happening simply because persons are following standards of professional conduct. Also, it's very interesting to note that when you look at students in their careers, that persons who give trouble with regards to professionalism during dental training, during pharmacy training, during medical training, they're much more likely to demonstrate unprofessional conduct when they graduate. What that means then is if we can have early intervention and teach and train you about the issues surrounding prof uh, professionalism, there's a good chance we can help you with your future career. 
And that's part of what's taking place in health professional schools all over the world as courses like these are introduced. Finally, the future of healthcare is a patient-centered approach. It used to be that whether you are a dentist or a nurse, whether you are an optometrist or a doctor, uh, you were the center of the patient's world. But in a world that's changing, in a world where people have choice, in a world where doctors are being evaluated and rented, much like rated, sorry, much like TripAdvisor, patient-centered care is the future of healthcare. And patient-centered care starts in an ethos of professionalism, as you will learn inside of this course. And so this issue of professionalism isn't just uh, uh, somebody uh, spouting a series of morals and telling you to follow a particular code. It does have real world implications that I want you to be aware of. Now, as we come to a close, because this is simply an introduction, I want to talk to you about something called professional identity formation. Professional identity formation. Now, we all have an identity, and that identity is formed over time. But what the literature tells us and what research shows us is that we also form a professional identity. And that definition is the process of internalizing a profession's core values and beliefs. So if you are studying optometry, there's a series of core values and beliefs within the profession of optometry. And for the purposes of this course, we're putting all of the health professionals in one because they have very similar core values and beliefs. Now, traditionally it was felt that professional behavior was simply the result of character, that individuals made choices based on early life experiences, based on their faith and their religious persuasion. And this was called virtues-based professionalism. And that definitely is true, that how you were raised, what is your faith, what experiences you had in early life have shaped you and will eventually shape your professional behavior. But one of the downfalls or one of the pitfalls of this particular perspective is that people who fully believed in this felt that professionalism cannot be taught during training. Today it's believed that professionalism is not just achieved simply by what happened to you in your early life, what is your faith and what are your personal core beliefs, but that the internal, sorry, the external construct of your profession, the values of your profession, are something that gradually acquired and reinforced in your life over time. And so professionalism identity formation or professional identity formation is something that occurs during your training and re is reinforced by the values that, that, are, that are explicitly declared to you and also by what you see taking place around you. And so I want you to be aware of that. Most of you are at the end of your teens, or in your early 20s, and the final parts of your identity are being formed. And part of that is your identity as a professional. And so over the next period of time during your training, you will form an identity of who you are and what it means to be a doctor or a dentist, what it means to be a nurse or a pharmacist. And those things will often stay with you for many, many years. And so I want you to be consciously thinking about what does it mean to have a professional identity? And this diagram here just summarizes now what we think are the factors that shape your professional identity. They include personal beliefs, moral values, and attitudes, but they also include what are the societal norms and expectations. And finally, they include what are the professional's codes of conduct, both overt and covert. And we'll talk about those covert things a little later when we talk about the hidden curriculum. So here's something, uh, a chart that is something that's often used in training doctors. It's called the Miller's Model of Clinical Competence. And it basically shows how you can move from knowing about something to that thing becoming a skill that you have developed. Now this has been adapted for professionalism, where it shows that 
as I give you information, I'm going to actually tell you what are the behavioral norms that are expected of you. But beyond simply telling you what are those behavioral norms, what we're hoping will happen over time is you will internalize those norms. You will learn to demonstrate those norms. And eventually those norms will become part of your identity. And that's what we mean by professional identity formation. So for now, I might tell you that as a health professional, it's important that you put the interests of your patient above your interest. And you might agree with that. And you might start demonstrating that over time. But what we want eventually is that to become part of who you are and not just something you do, but somebody you are. And so we can just say that you are becoming a particular type of human being. And that's why we spoke about the fact of uh, looking into the future, discovering your future. This, re this really is a journey of becoming. So I'm going to quote something I heard many years ago, which is very, very important. You are not just achieving. You're not just achieving a degree. You're not just achieving status in life, but you are becoming a particular type of person. So that ends our session today. Uh, it's simply an introduction to the whole issue of professionalism, ethics, and communication. Uh, I hope that this has given you a sense of things that you should be thinking about beyond the anatomy you will learn about the structure of the eye or the structure of the tooth or the structure of the human body, beyond the physiology that you will study about how the heart works and how the brain works, beyond the pathology you will study about what's going wrong here and what's going wrong there. The questions we'll be asking you in this course are, who are you becoming? What's guiding the choices you're making? And ultimately, what type of doctor are you going to be? Until we meet again next time, looking forward to being with you.